to the NATA Safety First Views from the Ramp. I'm your host, Mike France, the Managing Director of Safety and Training here at NATA. Really excited to be joined by Daniel Baker, C CEO of FlightAware. Daniel, thanks for joining us. Glad you could make it today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Thanks, Mike. So this is usually the point uh, of the day where I would... Uh, you know, do a little bit of introduction of the company, but something tells me with our audience here, you don't need a lot of introduction. Um, I was reading on your website, uh, working with over 10,000 aircraft operators and uh, 13 million passengers. That's uh, that's quite an accomplishment. Yeah, thank you very much. It's it's exciting. Flight Aware, uh, a little over 15 years now, and really a labor of love of folks like me that love aviation and uh, really enjoy the positive impact and I think that shows in the product and it shows in the success of the business and it's uh, it's been exciting to go from such a small company a couple of years ago with uh, really narrow goals to broadly having an impact across uh, more than 10,000 business aviation operators a couple hundred airlines around the world uh, and being able to every day help more people and make travel more reliable and efficient and reduce stress and uh, have a positive impact on aviation. Well, I know uh, for me, you know, I travel pre-COVID, obviously, with NATA extensively, and uh, rarely does it go by that I get on a flight without the text from one of my kids saying, hey, Dad, don't forget to send me your flight information. And uh, what they're really looking for is that little link from FlightAware so that they can keep an eye on the flight, know when I've landed, and uh, and so on. Just matter of fact, just last week, I was in Texas uh, visiting some FBOs, and uh, you know it's hard to find an FBO lobby that doesn't have a display up with uh, flight aware showing the inbound uh, inbound aircraft. And you know I, I have to geek out just for a moment here. I'm I'm, I'm one of those guys that even had uh, you know the Raspberry Pi computer running uh, the Pi Aware with my own oh, ADSB oh, oh, oh. feeding information into the network. So uh, it's really for me it's really exciting to get a chance to chat with you today. Oh, well, thank you oh, so thank much. You Likewise, so much. I've got one of those at home, and it's just been so <laughs> fun to, so fun to uh, build our own infrastructure and uh, uh, suddenly have suddenly access have to access access wealth of information, information in lots of ways. And I think, I think one of the most exciting things about having that type of coverage and having additional information is not just having, for example, more positions to put on a map, which helps the experience of flight tracking, but what else can you do with that information, right? So being able to get two positions a second from an airplane in the air on the ground, now we're able to do things like send alerts when an airplane goes on APU and the avionics power on. We're able to send alerts on where the airplane parked. We're figuring out what runways are in use. And so the beauty of the additional coverage is more than just uh, being able to track flights more widely and more frequently, but it's being able to kind of go higher and higher and maybe even deeper and deeper into what's going on at that airport and with those flights. Um, you know, you mentioned all the all the people using FlightAware, and that was a surprise early on because uh, you might say, okay, there's a, for example, a, a business aviation flight operating, there's probably a couple people interested in tracking that, but there are so many stakeholders, right? You have the FBOs on both sides, you have flight department managers and uh, mechanics, yeah, I mean, you have family members, you have personal assistants, you have, um, you know, people who are providing different operational services to the aircraft, maybe ground, uh, transportation and uh, it's not uncommon for a simple domestic flight to have a couple dozen stakeholders of people who are um, all committed to uh, helping that trip go smoothly even beyond just the flight part but you know what is the purpose of it is it a factory visit is it some sort of site visit is it a is it a meeting it takes a lot of people uh, to, to be able to pull that off and so it's cool to be able to help them essentially predict the future. Right? When is the flight going to arrive? What are the risk factors on delays and diversions and, and weather uh, and be able to provide peace of mind? And people have to wait around a lot less, right? The, um, uh, the FBO knows, for example, if the flight diverted late at night to some other airport, they, can, uh, they might not they need, might to need to wait, wait for, for some late night arrival or family members can know what to expect. Certainly car services don't need to sit around for hours if they know the flight hasn't even left yet. So those sorts of, you know, uh, impacts are probably bigger than uh, uh, just the uh, awareness uh, component that most people think of. 
Well, I definitely encourage uh, our audience here today, if you're one of the like 12 or 13 people who's never heard of flightaware.com, go to the website and check it out, uh, especially as an aviation uh, enthusiast. There's a lot of great stuff there. You can even find the instructions on, you know, building your own ADSB receiver and right. putting uh, putting data directly into uh, the FlightAware network. So that's, right. uh, that's really exciting stuff. So while I could spend the entire day just sitting here talking about FlightAware and, and how it evolved and how it grew and, and what it means to the industry, we're actually here to talk about something a little different today. We're here to talk about the Clean Flying Coalition. Um, you know what, I'm just gonna, Danny, I'm gonna kick it to you and let you kind of introduce what is the Clean Flying Coalition and, and how did it come to be? So the Clean Flying Coalition is a nonprofit group of business aviation stakeholders who have all come together to uh, ensure the safety a, a, of flight operations and passengers and crew uh, in the era of COVID-19. And FlightAware, you know, normally is uh, central to aviation from a data perspective, from an application perspective, the sort of features that we were just talking about that we'll provide between flight departments uh, and maybe it's airlines and FBOs and all, all the different stakeholders. And today we uh, decided that we wanted to be central to aviation in a different way. And what we're doing is we're leveraging all the relationships that we have, whether it be with uh, flight training companies, with aircraft manufacturers, with FBOs, uh, with large flight departments, with charter and fractional, and saying, hey, we have a challenge here. Uh, we need to come together and have uh, a way to communicate all of the things that all these organizations and companies are doing uh, to keep business aviation safe and to make business aviation safe. And you know, unlike the airline world, which is a relatively small number of very large aircraft operators, uh, when you look at flight departments, when you look at flight schools, you look at these small organizations, they don't necessarily have all of the resources that a Delta Airlines or United Airlines might have. Right. And so, and so they both want to learn about what others are doing, uh, you know, maybe large fractionals or charter companies. Um, but also when a flight department manager is saying, all right, we're going to start flying, flying again uh, after the, the shutdowns and, and during this pandemic. And we need to know what are FBOs doing? You know, what do we need to be aware of to be in compliance in? Uh, how do we assure the passengers of the safety practices? Uh, and those are the sort of things that uh, the Clean Flying Coalition is uh, trying to communicate and aggregate among all of the members. That's fantastic. And if I'm right, uh, it's been established now for about a month. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, found, uh, uh, good. Go ahead. Please. I would say with founding members, uh, you know, you've got uh, what Atlantic Aviation, Flight Safety, Four Flight, Global Appearance Partners, Go Rental, Simcom. Keystone Aviation, TAC Air, and now NATA has joined uh, as well. It, uh, it's a fantastic start in just 30 days to bringing a, a wide segment of our industry together to uh, start to make information available. Yeah, and I think that it goes to show, um, perhaps most importantly, how seriously uh, business aviation is taking this and how all of these key stakeholders are uh, jumping at the opportunity to say, what else can we do? What can we learn? How can we communicate this to people? Uh, how can we spread the word uh, about the things that we've learned and that we've implemented? Uh, and it also goes to show how big the ecosystem is, right? This isn't just about uh, the crew needing to do things. This isn't just about FBOs and their practices. Um, the life cycle includes flight training providers, right? So the, the crews need to have, a, need safe to have a safe training to provide um, and receive the flight training they need. The FBOs uh, need to be able to provide services to keep their staff healthy, to keep the crew and passengers of arriving aircraft healthy. There's ground uh, transportation. That's a, that's a component that needs to be addressed. And then the cleaning providers as well. So um, there's, there's a lot more to it. I didn't touch on all of them, but it gives you a sense that we've stepped back and we've talked to all of our customers and said, this is a big ecosystem. And uh, if we're not all aligned, if we're not all making flight departments comfortable, if we're not all doing things that the passengers are saying that that works for me, you might as well not do it. It requires essentially 100% participation, not necessarily in the coalition, that would be great, but 100% participation and taking this seriously. And what we're seeing from the industry is that's happening. Yeah, looking at the, the list of uh, uh, organizations across the industry that are uh, participating right now, it's a, a fantastic start. In the, in the short run, you know, over the last 30 days, the next 60, 90, 8, uh, 120 days, what do you see as the, the Clean Flying Coalition bringing to the industry that was absent prior to? 
Yeah, I think that what we're starting to see is that the the largest stakeholders that have been operating throughout all of this were quick to both uh, adopt the best practices, join the coalition, communicate that. Um, but now we're seeing this is the end of summer. This is the end of sort of the uh, leisure travel period. And now it's the uh, approaching uh, Labor Day and let's get back to work. And so we're going to see an entirely new type of aircraft operator uh, that maybe has been sitting on the sidelines since the March time period when uh, a lot of, for example, Part 91 operators uh, stopped flying for, for business travel. And so I think what we're going to see is a lot of people come out of the woodwork and say, okay, what's changed in the industry? What are the practices that we need to uh, adopt and embrace and start to enforce on uh, our flight department on maintenance, on cleaning, on passengers, and how can we, what are those best practices that we need to conform to? So we've seen um, you know, a terrific rebound since March, um, primarily in leisure travel, and a ton of that is in charter and fractional. Uh, and we haven't seen that yet in the small Part 91 doing business travel, which in many ways is the bread and butter of year-round business aviation. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we look back to uh, to January and uh, think about uh, the, the cha unknown challenges that uh, lie ahead of us. Um, sure. What, uh, you know, back in January, so now here we are, like you said, finding ourselves coming up on the uh, September just next week already. Uh, how do you see the Clean Flying Coalition being uh, positioned to be able to answer some of these unknown challenges that, that may come up as we're transitioning back to trying to find business aviation to find its footing and, and get into a growth mode again? Well, I think the business aviation is uh, well poised to help people who say, okay, we need to get back to work. We need to start doing these business trips again that we have deferred for a while. But the question becomes, um, how can we do them safely? And there's both a flight component and then there's the, the business and the, the meeting component. Uh, but I think that there's going to be a lot of demand for uh, a lot of questions about how are people doing this, right? Are people doing meetings outside? Um, are people s still spend spending the night at locations? Are people doing meals at? Are people doing catering on the aircraft? Um, I think a lot of people uh, are saying we really need to get back to work and leverage business aviation, uh, and they're wondering how how they can do that. And BA is a great tool right now. Uh, there's a lot of people in different circumstances who have concerns about airline travel, and people are saying, look, this is a safe this is a safe way to travel. And we just need to make sure that that's, that's true across every part of the, the life cycle of a flight. And I think there'll be elements of, of clean flying saying, how can you have that meeting, right? It's not just about the air travel. Uh, it's about that last mile once you, once you get on the ground. And I think that that's something that FBOs are thinking about and talking about as well. So Daniel, one question would be uh, for the folks that are watching different, in, different parts of our industries, whether it's FBOs or 135 operators, uh, what can they do right now to be a part of the Clean Flying Coalition and help drive that message forward? Well, there's an opportunity for everyone. And for the uh, aviation companies that are large and are looking to communicate what they're doing uh, and try and have an impact at large on the industry, you can certainly join and become a member of the Clean Flying Coalition, which there's no charge. It's a nonprofit. Uh, and we welcome your participation. For folks who are, for example, a Part 91 flight department or a small uh, 135 that's wanting to learn about the best practices, learn what to expect at FBOs, learning how they should be responding and preparing, you can go to the website cleanflying.aero and subscribe for free to get email updates from all of the other stakeholders and partners. And that will enable you to be able to receive the latest information as we learn and evolve uh, and as the industry even responds even more aggressively to this to ensure that you're doing everything you can in your operation to operate safe. Well, no, that's fantastic. And Daniel, uh, just appreciate your time today. It was uh, great to number one, talk a little bit about uh, uh, FlightAware and uh, really awesome to look at where we're going and what the industry is doing through the Clean Flying Coalition. I, I guess we could kind of wrap up with the question, you know, what uh, what should I have asked you about with the Clean Flying Coalition today that that we didn't get to? Is there anything else we're missing here? I think I think you've really hit all the important points. And I think the, the only remaining thing is we invite everyone to participate. This is something that requires everyone, right? We need every, we want business aviation to just be a leader uh, in safety. 
uh, both in policy and process and in just minimizing risk. And this is something that we talk about all the time as it relates to crew training and to new avionics. It's all about safely providing transportation. And so this is something that's going to impact everyone, like it or not, and uh, we're all here to help. And this is uh, something that we're doing just in the best interest of the community and invite everyone to participate. So I appreciate your, your interest in it. I appreciate your enthusiasm and the opportunity to uh, speak to our peers and colleagues in the industry. Well, again, thank you, Daniel. Do appreciate your time. And to our viewers, thank you for giving us a few minutes. Um, now's an awesome time to hit pause real quick and go down there and hit subscribe so that you can get the latest episode of Views from the Ramp. Uh, but with that, uh, we will wrap it up today and uh, look forward to seeing you on the next edition of the NATA Safety First Views from the Ramp.